I don't know if you realize that. And uh, those drug dealers down in South America don't really don't really love you very much. They love you for your they love your money. They don't love you. Anyway, they don't care. Uh, not only that, they want to make as much money as possible. Remember, it's money. It is the most important thing. So they want to make as much money as possible. So they, they may cut it. They, and they may cut it down to 10% or 20%. But the difference between 10% and 20% is times two. So if it's, if it's only been cut 20%, and everybody that gets a hold of it, they cut it some more. So you may not be getting very much stuff. Which is a good thing, or it's a bad thing. Anyway, so you might have you might shoot up this time with a whole a whole bunch of it thinking, well, it's probably only 10% heroin. Yeah, it may be 25% heroin, and now you're dead. Whoops. So it's dangerous, you never know. These are not very reputable individuals. Most people have other responsibilities. They need to take those responsibilities. And you may tell, tell yourself, I have other responsibilities that are more important than my pleasure. Is there anything more important than your pleasure? There is? Oh, sorry. I was worried there for a second. Um, the first year I was here, uh, Kevin, Kevin Cody from uh, Pinyon. Uh, he was a cop out in Penyon, and then he was security over here. Uh, he came and talked to my this class, to the substance abuse class, and he was telling about telling us about uh, individuals who sold their children for crystal meth in Penyon to get a hit. They sold their children for sex. They sold them. They just sold them. How important are your kids? Well, to most people, your kids are really, really important to you. But to those people, the shooting up with or smoking their meth was more important than their children. They gave them away. They sold them. So sometimes you don't do the responsible thing. Uh, the reward reinforcement pathway encourages a human to perform or repeat an action that promotes survival. Usually that's what it's for. You do something right. Uh, you run really fast and you get away from the, uh, from the tiger that's chasing you or you climb a tree and you feel really good about it. Why do you feel really good about it? Because the reward reinforcement pathway has told you that you have done something good. And it makes you feel you, almost euphoric. It makes you feel great. Because I did something that nobody else could do. I survived that tiger attack and other people were killed. So I feel good because the, my reward reinforcement pathway has told me that I've done something good. I pick up a, uh, a strange looking fruit on the, on, the, uh, on the path and I eat it and, uh, and it feeds me and I'm not hungry anymore. And I'm going, oh, this is good. I need to eat this fruit. I need to remember what this fruit looks like so I can pick it up again and I can eat it again. That's the way it works. So you are rewarded. You have this reward reinforcement pathway that tells you that food is good, that uh, way of defending yourself is a, is a good way of defending yourself. And so it makes you feel good. <clears throat> That's one of the reasons why uh, people feel so good if their football team wins or if their baseball team wins. They feel euphoric. It's their reward reinforcement pathway that is, that is being stimulated. If you, those of you who uh, participated in, in high school athletics, if your team won, you felt really, really good. And if you lost, you didn't feel so good. Well, the reward, it was the reward reinforcement pathway that, that was telling you, this is a good thing. And so it, it has to do with survival. It has to do with, uh, oh, this is good food. I can eat it the next time I come, I come walking through here. Um, you know, you, uh, you're hungry and you kill a rabbit and you skin it and you eat it. And now you're, you feel good, you feel, you feel satiated, you feel like you've done something that you should have done. And that's a reward reinforcement pathway. It's this pathway that is affected by psychoactive substances. Unfortunately, we've got this thing in our brains. <clears throat> and it's okay, I mean, it, it allowed us to survive, humans. I mean, we're all over the place now. And we've been able to survive. And the reason we've been able to survive is because we have this re reward reinforcement pathway telling us to do the same thing over and over again something that uh, helps us. This feels good, therefore I will do this again. Unfortunately, psychoactive drugs uh, stimulate the reward reinforcement pathway. 
also referred to as the mesolimbic uh, <laughs> dopaminergic uh, reward pathway. It has a stop switch, which is in your orbital frontal cortex, in other words, your reasoning portion of your brain, and it has a Moore switch. Now, the Moore switch is part of the uh, reward reinforcement, reinforce, reinforcement pathway. The Moore area is, known also, is also known as the pleasure center, and it encompasses four structures. Your amygdala, remember your amygdala has to do with emotion, so it tells you that it, it, it makes you emotional about whatever has happened to you. The lateral hypothalamus, <clears throat> so part of your hypothalamus, remember your hypothalamus controls everything. The nucleus accumbens septi is another area, and the last is the ventral tegmental area. So these are the four structures of the reward reinforcement pathway. If we can stimulate any one of these four areas, then potentially you'll feel really good about it. Okay. <laughs> now this gets a little weird. Have you ever been around somebody that seemed to like to, to be a, get emotional, and it made them, they just wanted to be emotional all the time? It was either this emotion or that emotion. Why in the world were they like that? Why did they like to be unhappy? They wanted extreme emotion. They sought extreme emotion. Have you, have you ever been around somebody like that? What's happening is they're, they're getting, the, the amygdala is being stimulated, and that's stimulating the rest of this. So they're, getting, they're being rewarded by their emotions. Usually it's positive emotions, but it can be negative emotions. So you've got somebody that enjoys being depressed. They get a buzz out of being depressed, as strange as that sounds. And these people are out there. We run into them from time to time. Counselors run into them all the time. But usually they don't want to go see the counselor because they're, getting, they're being rewarded by their negative emotions. So they don't want to change. They don't want, to, they don't want that to go away because this is, this is part of their whole reward uh, reinforcement uh, stimulation, as bizarre as that sounds. So um, these things can get screwed up. Yes, ma'am? Is that a, is that a, <coughs> would that be a situation where the person is in it all the time and they become that way? Or is it genetic or Somebody, something has happened to them in their past where they got something for having negative emotions. Uh, they were rewarded for it. Uh, they got to stay home from, from school uh, because they were crying too much. So now all of a sudden, it has been crying uh, has been rewarded. So we, the next time they cry in front of their parents, they get whatever they want. So now we've got now we've got a control in, uh, issue taking place. So, so like as these person grow, as this person grows up, this is one of their techniques for making themselves feel better. It's like a trained behavior. It is a trained behavior. It's conditioned response. Yeah, but it, this is what's being stimulated. So they keep crying, mm -hmm. and then they get married, and, and this is what they use to uh, control their significant other, whether it's male or female, it doesn't really matter. Or, I don't know. <laughs> they're controlling their significant other. I know, isn't that fun? <laughs> uh, the pleasure center serves two purposes. It gives a feeling of satisfaction when a need is fulfilled, or, or even the anticipation that a need will be fulfilled. All you need to do is feel like, okay, I'm going to get it right now. This is good. Okay, so it, it actually, just thinking that you're going to, to get whatever it is that you're looking for. Oh man, I really love uh, Granny Smith apples, and I'm going to the store to buy me Granny Smith apples. Oh man, yeah, I feel really good about this. I can't wait to get to Walmart and buy me some Granny Smith apples. Sometimes I drive all the way to Albuquerque to get me brand new some apples. <laughs> the ones at Bosch are crap. Those are the green ones. <laughs> but not just any green apple. It has to have it has to has to have those little white dots on it, which tells you that the skin is still attached to the to the, the pulp of the apple. Right. Okay, we know this. Now, I shouldn't have told you guys. Now you're going to go and buy all my Granny Smith apples. The ones from my Okay. 
<laughs> Just thinking that you're going to get it makes you feel good. Here I am, I'm jumping up and down because I'm thinking of Granny Smith apples and I have two of them in my, my, for my lunch today. i got a confession. <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I count those apples, damn it. <laughs> I know exactly how many apples I got. That's all right. I was in, I was in uh, Iowa. Wasn't I in Iowa? Where was it? Where did I go? Thanksgiving break. Oh, it's Thanksgiving. I went to Florida. I was in Florida with my son. So. I got a call from my son last night. This is how it works with my son. He called me on the phone and I was still at work. So I talked to him for about 13 minutes. I said, I gotta go home. And I said, I'll call you back. And he said, fine. You, you can never get him back. He won't, he won't answer the phone. <laughs> I don't know what else he wanted to talk about. Maybe he wanted to borrow money. That's okay. I got, I got five bucks in the mail yesterday. They sent me a new five dollar bill. Nielsen, I'm a Nielsen family. They sent me five dollars. Now I've got five free dollars. I don't know what to do with it. It doesn't feel like it's mine. You know, somebody gives you five dollars, it doesn't feel like it's yours. I feel like I should give it away or something. <laughs> I was I'll take it. <laughs> I knew he would take it. Damn. Uh, <laughs> you think I'm kidding? I re it really doesn't feel like my, my money. It's not my money. They just gave it to me. I just got a surge from giving him five dollars. He's not going to keep it, so I'll put it back in my pocket. If I if I thought you'd keep it, I'd, I'd give it to you. Yeah, I'll take it. Okay. It's, it's like I said, it's not it's not my money. They just gave it. To me. It's a brand new five dollar bill. You should give us all five dollars. I don't have that much money. <laughs> I only had one five dollar bill, and I only had one that wasn't well, mine. That well, you gave away one of your three. You have two more to give away. <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have any more. I have, I have one dollar bill. I have three one dollar bills. Remember, I just bought that guy a new battery for his truck. But I get it. I'll frame it. Yeah, frame it. Just makes sense. <laughs> okay, so part one of the things is that you just the anticipation of getting something makes you feel good. It gives you a surge of relief or intense satisfaction when pain is diminished. And of course, if you've ever been in pain uh, you, and you take a pill, uh, usually the pain will go away right away, even though you know that it takes 20 minutes for that painkiller to get into your system. It still goes away right away. Psychoactive substances activate the pleasure circuit and rewards the individual with a feeling of satisfaction or pain relief. Unfortunately, psychoactive substances overactivate the pleasure center and shut down the stop switch, enabling the individual to feel an intense need to continue use. And this is what happens with gamblers. This is what happens with people who shoot up with heroin. They shoot up with heroin, and the next time is really soon. They feel like they need to do it again. <clears throat> Why do people shoot up with heroin? Heroin's a little different from other drugs. <clears throat> Does heroin make you feel good? <clears throat> Has anybody ever taken heroin? Do you know if it makes you feel good? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> And there is a, a deal of euphoria to it, but actually it, it takes the pain away. That's all it does. It makes you forget. And sometimes it's the, it's the fact that you can't, you can't not think about this, and that's what the problem is. The problem is you, you keep repeating on this negative thought and you want it to go away. So that's why heroin users have a harder time, to, harder time quitting? They're because they're making bad thoughts go away. Maybe they've done something in their life they want to forget. And when they, when they use the heroin, it makes them forget. Uh, this, this was huge in the, in the rock industry. Uh, all those guys were, were shooting up with heroin. And they were shooting up with heroin because they were being given heroin. 
as stupid as that sounds. But people who take heroin, a lot of times, uh, it it destroys your ability to do things. I mean, you can't. You were a guitar player before. Now, all of a sudden, you can't. You're not as good as you were before because of the heroin. So this is a pro this can be a problem. But if they really had something to forget, if they weren't doing it just for the euphoria, because it makes you feel like you're dead or like nothing matters anymore. That's what it makes you feel like. And, and some people need that feeling, and so they just continue to use it. They're trying to make the pain go away. Now remember, we've got all these people in the United States who are taking hypoxycontin and hydrocodone, they're taking all these synthetic opiates, they're taking uh, opioids, they're taking opiates, uh, shooting up with heroin. Uh, one of the questions is, why are they doing this? And the answer is because they're trying to make the pain go away. Now remember this reward uh, reinforcement pathway uh, works for two different reasons. One, it makes you anticipate that something is going to happen, and the other, it makes the pain go away. So that's why they're doing it. They're trying to make the pain go away. What pain do they have? And is that pain severe enough that they really need to take this stuff? And the answer, I mean, we've got kids that are finding it in their parents' uh, medicine cabinets, and they're using these opiates. What do they, what has happened to them in their life that they need to forget? Now, we can assume that there is something that they need to forget, but sometimes they just do it. And then they, they don't have anything to forget. So why do they continue to do it? Because it becomes an, uh, an addiction. So the opium becomes a, an addiction unto itself. There are three phases of brain activity with the re reward reinforcement pathway. The anticipation of drug use or compulsive uh, behavior creates craving, of course. Uh, internal or external cues activate uh, the amygdala, which causes a release of dopamine from the ventral tegmental area, which in turn activates the nucleus accumbens, causing craving. Whew. So we have stimulated your reward reinforcement pathway just by thinking that you're going to get what you think you're going to get. Uh, for an alcoholic passing a bar, which is an external cue, it would activate the amygdala, causing a release of dopamine from the ventral tegmental area, which would activate the nucleus accumbens, causing a crazy craving for alcohol. All they have to do is pass the bar. This is a place where they've drunk before. And this is the way it works. This is one of the reasons why they tell you you have to change your lifestyle. If you, if you stay in the same place, if you stay with the same lifestyle, you're never going to stop drinking because just passing the bar gives you a buzz. It makes you think of drinking. So what do you have to do? You have to stay away from the bar. Don't go past the bar. If you have friends that every time you're around these guys, they make you, they force you to smoke marijuana, they invite you to smoke marijuana, so you do, then you have to stay away from those guys. Oh, shit. Oh, I didn't do it. Okay. I, I touched that thing. Anyway, that's the way it works. you got to stay away from somebody. So is it like passing a walking past a, a Cinnabon? <laughs> if you crave Cinnabon, yes, it's exactly like walking past a Cinnabon or smelling a Cinnabon. That's all, all you have to do is smell, right? Yeah. Okay. And you can actually taste the, uh, the that stuff on top, the icing on top, right? Are you a cinnamon addict? I just had one over the weekend. Oh, okay. How was it? It wasn't it was as good as you thought it was going to be, did it? Uh, I had a craving. I told, I told my class yesterday I had a craving for chocolate cake. I haven't eaten a chocolate cake in probably five years. I had a craving for chocolate cake. So I went to Bosch's and bought me cake mix. As it turned out, I could have bought it out over at the gas station. But I went to Bosch's and bought cake mix. I made up, I made a cake, and I ate like, I don't know, like a quarter of it last, uh, night before last, and I got sick. So last night, this is how stupid I am. <laughs> so last night, I had a huge piece of cake. It was probably an eighth of that, of that cake. And I got sick again. So the question is, I've still got half the cake left. Am I going to eat any tonight, is the question. <laughs> Chris and I are, are addicted to, to, to foods. <laughs> will I eat it again? Or will I try to give, give it to Marius? Huh? 
he screwed up my mis you know. Did you make the cake? I made the cake. Did you make the cake? Of course I made the cake. <laughs> <laughs> He's got three boys. I could give him I could give him my cake. Oh, yeah, there you go. Maybe I'll just try to pawn the cake off on Mars. That'll work. Then I won't eat it. There's two things that are going to happen. Well, three things. I could eat the cake again. I could give it to Marius, or I could throw it away. Or you can sell it and get your five dollars back. <laughs> it's not my five dollars. <laughs> the cake didn't cost me five dollars anyway. The cake probably cost I don't know three bucks. I'm guessing. I don't know. I, I didn't even notice how expensive. Plus it was. labor is two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sell it to Marius. How's that? <laughs> no, I'll, I'll see if I can give it away. That's a good idea. I'll give it. I'll give my cake away to Marius. I'm not going to eat it again. Okay? It only takes two. You only have to hit me twice. The first time I go with you, really? Did that hurt? And the second time I go, yeah, that really hurt. Uh, I've only been drunk three times, and it only took me three times to figure out that I didn't like it. So maybe this time I'll stop eating that damn cake. It's good cake. I mean, it tastes great. Really moist. You should make this one. <laughs> I should bring it to you guys. <laughs> yeah, my cake. Good idea. <clears throat> uh, the second phase of the reward reinforcement... Pa oh, wait a minute. I didn't even talk about this. Uh, for someone who smoked pot with their friends before they went away to college, when they see their friends on spring break, that's, that's the external cue, it would activate the amygdala, causing a release of dopamine from the ventral tegmental area, which would activate the nucleus accumbens, causing a craving for pot. Just being around your friends again. And this is what happens with uh, athletes. Uh, athletes will go off and, and make millions of dollars. Uh, they'll get a signing bonus for a couple million dollars. They'll go home and they're around all of their friends that... Uh, uh, that they played sports with potentially in college or in high school. Uh, some of these guys are, are drug addicts now. Some of these guys are drunks. Uh, so what do they do? They use with their friends and then now all of a sudden their, their skills are gone. Uh, this happened to a guy by the name of Lynn Bias. He was the uh, uh, best basketball player in, in the United States in 1979. <laughs> so Lynn went home to Baltimore uh, he's, he, was, uh, he played for the University of Maryland, went home to Baltimore, and uh, he snorted cocaine and it killed him. His heart, he had a heart attack and died. <clears throat> had he ever used uh, cocaine before? Well, they didn't know. They couldn't tell. I mean, everybody said, no, Lynn's never used cocaine before. But he used it with his friends, and, now he, and, and then he died. He died almost instantaneously. It arrests your heart. And he had a heart attack and died. This kind of stuff happens all the time. Daryl Strawberry, baseball player from back in the in the 80s, uh, went went home to Florida. He was from Florida. Started using with his friends. His skills just tanked. Uh, a guy by the name of Dwight Gooden. Was, he had the best year of baseball that anybody has ever seen. He won 28 games and he lost two. He was so unhittable. He only lost two games, and he only lost those two games by, by two runs. He lost each game by, by a run. Um, he was unhittable. Nobody could touch him. He uh, went home, and he visited one of his friends. His friend had um, uh, cocaine, and he snorted cocaine, and the guy never, he never broke even before, uh, I, again, in, in his baseball career. He lost as many games as he won. He was hittable now, all of a sudden. It had it decreased his ability to play baseball that much. And so these kinds of things happen uh, to people all the time. All right. Uh, the second phase of the reward reinforcement pathway involves the brain telling the individual to do it again after ingesting the psychoactive substance. Uh, with use, uh, dopamine is released from the ventral tegmental area, which activates a nucleus accumbens to continue the craving. So you still have this craving, so you want to do it again. This is one of the problems with crystal meth. If you have a pile of crystal meth, if you have well, however it comes, I have no idea how they, how they sell this stuff, but if you've got crystal meth and you use some of it, you're not going to save it for tomorrow afternoon. <coughs> It's not the way it works. If you've got a pile of that stuff, you use it. You use all of it. You don't share it with your friends. 
This isn't a drug that people share, like pot. Uh, it's, not a, it's, it's not something that everybody gets a shot of. If you've got some, you use it all yourself. That's the way it works. And if you use it, you usually, usually use it all up at one sitting, if you possibly can, because that's the way it works. It just tells you to keep going, and you keep going. You really can't overdose on this stuff, and that's, you can't overdose on cocaine either. What, but uh, cocaine is a vasoconstrictor, so is, is crystal meth to some extent. It can kill you, but you can't overdose on it. And for that reason, people thought that cocaine wasn't addictive, because it, 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 you couldn't uh, overdose on it. But of course it is. Marijuana, you can't overdose on marijuana. You can't overdose on LSD. What is, what is the thinking of somebody who goes to prison, like say um, they're, they're, they do crystal meth all the time and right. everything, and then they get caught selling it and they end up in prison for five years and then they get out and then they just go right go back. Right to back. It. They go right back. So it's the most addictive substance, except for nicotine. Nicotine is actually the most addictive substance. But people, they can't stop. I mean, you just use it one time and you're addicted. That's why I, you were up in Montana. They had all those advertisements telling you not even once. You start it and you can't stop. It's because of this craving. But it, even after like five years? No, isn't that nuts? It's crazy. I had a student got out of jail. She'd been in jail for a year and a half. What was the first thing she did? Go see her kids? No, she <laughs> found some meth <laughs> and she shot up. And the only way she could stay away from it was because all, what happened to her, she came back to the reservation. The reservation, they had just busted everybody on the reservation. There was no meth. It was all coming from Fort Peck anyway. And that was the only way she was able to stay away from it, was because it was gone. There wasn't any around. But the first time she went back to uh, Great Falls, all she had to do was drive in town. And she saw the places where she shot up. This is the dumpster. I shot up behind that dumpster. I shot up over there behind that bar. That's all she had to do. And she went and found herself some more meth. It's that addictive. You can't not do it. And she had two boys. She had two boys. All right. Sorry. She had two boys. And she loved them. She just thought they were the best things in the whole wide world. And they were, except for crystal meth. <clears throat> and it was worse than that, because when she used crystal meth, she didn't have enough money to buy this stuff. So she would forge checks, and that's, that's how she got caught. She didn't really get caught for, uh, she got caught for, for uh, forging checks. She didn't get caught with crystal meth, but she couldn't stay away from this. And it gave her meth head. It gave her, oh God, they're so stupid. And they just are totally illogical, people on crystal meth. So the phase three of the reward reinforcement pathway involves a nucleus accumbens signaling, signaling the or orbital frontal cortex that it has taken in the substance and asks for a signal of more or satiation. Are you done? If, it, if it's crystal meth, this is the only word that, that uh, will come out of, of uh, your orbital frontal cortex. In addicts and abusers, the signal is weakened, as is the reasoning function of the uh, area, resulting in, in ingestion that does not lead to satiation. You will never feel satiated. They chase what they refer to as the dragon. It's the, the first time you use it, it makes you feel so good uh, that ever after that, you're trying to find, you're trying to catch the dragon, the dragon that you got on the first time that you uh, used this stuff. And you can never find it. You can never catch it again. But that's what they're looking for. They're looking for a memory of what it felt like. Psychoactive substances imprint the memory of euphoria or pain relief more deeply than most natural surviving survival memories. Remember that apple that we, I was talking about before? Or that piece of fruit that you found that tasted so good and it fed you? It doesn't imprint as, as strongly as an addictive substance. 
The alteration of the brain chemistry causes normal activities to be less pleasurable. And this is the problem with pot. Pot makes you feel really good. But when you're not smoking pot, you f don't feel good. You, don't, you feel bad. It's the same way with alcohol. Alcohol makes you feel good, if it makes you feel good. <clears throat> makes me depressed. But if, if it makes you feel good, when you're not drunk, then you're looking for an excuse to get drunk. So you become what they refer to as a dry drunk. You're really grouchy. And you start, you start trying to get people to, to be angry with you so you can, you've got an excuse to go out and drink. And if you've ever been around an alcoholic, you see this happening all the time. They want to argue with people. And then they go, oh, that's all. I can't stand it anymore. Then they go out and get drunk. Gives them an excuse to get drunk. So this is one of the reasons why being around an alcoholic is so difficult. Because they're always trying to get you to do, to, uh, uh, to do something so that they can use that as an excuse to get drunk. Um, and of course, if they, can't get, if they can't get you to do anything, then they may become abusive because they're really, really grouchy. But then again, people that smoke pot are really grouchy when they're not stoned. They're not very happy. They're bored about everything. Not, and they're bored with it, anything. When they're smoking pot, they, they're interested in everything. Dude, my hand, did you see my hand? That's so cool. But when they're not smoking pot, uh, the, nothing is interesting. They can play video games stoned all night long. But afterward, I mean, if they're not stoned, it's not nearly as much fun. Not nearly as much fun. They can't even play the video game. It's so boring now. Everything's boring. They're using that as an excuse to go out and get stoned again. All right. <laughs> to a methamphetamine uh, addict, uh, the desire for drugs, for their drug, will be more important than her relationship with her children. And we've seen this over and over again. We saw this in Pinyon. But it's not just Pinyon. It's not just here on the reservation. It's everywhere. Anybody. They'll sell their kids. They'll sell themselves for, for, for uh, another hit. Uh, they'll, and they'll sell their children. Literally, they'll sell their children. They'll let their children die. Um, the situation on, uh, not uh, Fort Belknap, but uh, Rocky Boy. Rocky Boy Reservation. Uh, they would have meth parties. Uh, and you think, meth parties, wait a minute, I, I just told you that if I, if I have a stash of meth, that I use it all up. Well, yeah, that's true, but uh, this is a good way to sell meth, is to invite people in. And so you can sell your meth, and then you can buy more. And these house parties will last for days, because as long as you're, they're giving you money, you're going out and getting more meth, and now you can... Have, you have more meth to sell more to more people, and you got just cars running in and running out. I mean, it's crazy stuff. Uh, one of my students had a, a sister with two, two kids. One of the kids was uh, was a baby; it was like nine months old, and the other was an eighteen year old, eighteen month old uh, boy. And she had a house party, and the house party started on Thursday night, and it lasted until Sunday, sometime on Sunday. And during that time, they had people running in and out and, and in and out. During that time, there was no food in the house, of course. Nobody's interested in food. There was no food in the house. Uh, so the, the kids were, were consuming what was there. Luckily, they weren't consuming meth. They were consuming the beer, the wine, anything in a glass. Sometimes there were ice cubes, so they got a little bit of water. Uh, so here's these kids. They're starving to death. That's not the worst part. The worst part is both of them were molested during the house party, and nobody knew. And of course, she was in the back room with her boyfriend or whatever, doing whatever they were doing. But the kids were molested during the, the, the house party, and of course, uh, they took them to the hospital. They checked them, and they both had they both had gonorrhea. And they both come down with. with Anyway, they've both been infected with the And this is the kind of stuff that happens to people. Now, why in the world did she care about her children enough to, for one, to feed them, but two, to take care of them, make sure that they were okay? <clears throat> and the answer is that at some point during that, that house party, she had actually sold the little boy to somebody for 
more money or for more meth. So they took the babies away from her. They took the kids away from her and they gave them to the grandparents. So what did the grandparents do? They gave them right back to her. Exactly. And of course she swore she'd never do this again until you know, the next month. Anyway, it happened again. And this time they, they didn't give them to the grandparents. They gave them to the daughter. They gave them to my student. And she was so angry at this lady that she didn't do anything. Anyway, or she didn't let her have her have their, her kids back until her parents nagged her enough that she gave the kids back to her to her, her sister. And then, of course, it happened again. But this is the kind of crap that happens. <clears throat> Crystal meth makes you stupid. Okay, it makes you not very smart. It's so addictive that you will you don't even care about your kids. So that's just a hint and a warning. Uh, to compulsive gamblers, uh, gambling will become more important to them than food or sex. And we see this. Gamblers will sit there, and one thing that they will do is they'll feed them uh, booze. They'll, they'll let them have booze, uh, but of course you can't have food at the gambling game. <laughs> and they'll sit there. They'll sit there for days, staying awake. And how do they stay awake? Well, you know, but if, if they were on their honeymoon, well, here's, here's a bride playing on the slot machine. Uh, you know, that's, sex isn't important to them. The gambling is, is a better high than, uh, than sex. Psychoactive substances tend to affect the, the physiological functioning of the body, uh, especially the heart rate and the respiration, especially opioids. It is the effect on the respiration that causes most drug overdose emergencies and death, and of course it's usually the opioids that kill you. But it can also be cocaine, which stimulates your heart to the extent that your heart starts racing and uh, you have a negative reaction from the uh, racing heart. If you have any problems with your heart, don't, don't use cocaine. You know, that uh, you, you, you may have a negative reaction. And it may kill you. It can kill you. All of this stuff can kill you. Not pot, not LSD. <laughs> Psychedelics like LSD, marijuana, and the rave drugs uh, not only affect the old brain, but the new brain as well. Usually this is all taking place in your brain stem, it's all taking place in your limbic system, and you really have, no, have very little control over it. Uh, your emotional reaction, of course you can, you can uh, reason and control your emotions, uh, this is what I was watching a, a war movie, hey, I was watching it last night. Uh, Battleground, if you've ever seen the movies made in 1949, it's about the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, but uh, they were under attack, and they were not on, only under uh, small arms fire, but they were also under artillery fire. And so these rounds are coming in, and of course, I don't know if you've ever been around, <laughs> you've never been, hopefully you've never been around an explosion, but it, um, uh, when you're around an explosion, you get a concussion. I mean, the, not a concussion in your head, but you get uh, a pressure. Yeah, it, yeah, you can feel it. Uh, people that have flown in helicopters can feel the helicopter blades flipping around. If they ever fly over, I could, it hits me right here in the chest. But uh, an explosion is the same way. I mean, it hits you, and there are waves of, of energy that, that are splashing against you. So, I mean, it's really, and it, of course, if there's detritus that's coming in, I mean, you're going to get hit in the face. And this is like a sandblaster, you know, it just hits you and, and it knocks you down. And this is what was happening last night, uh, well, in, in the movie, of course. Uh, and, and most people took it because they were in a spe specific place and they were supposed to stay there. But some people bolted and, and ran. And, of course, that was... Why am I talking about this? Oh, the old brain and the new brain. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the, the people that were experienced with this stuff, they, they rationalized the fact that I probably won't be killed. If I, if I am injured, of course, it means I get to come off the line, you know, all of that stuff. So they're just, ha they're just handling this stuff. The new guys are the ones that ha they had to, to watch to find out if they were going to bolt and run or not. Have you ever seen The Life of Aud Audie Murphy? And I can't, To Hell and Back, I think, is the name of the movie. The first time he was in combat, he... He, he ran, and he, he went back. Uh, Audie Murphy was the most decorated uh, military individual that we've ever had in the military. Uh, he won the Congressional Medal of Honor. He won the uh, 
uh, you know, Silver Star with Oakley clusters, which means he won it more than once. Uh, this was a very, very brave man, but the first time he was in combat, of course, he, uh, it scared him and he ran away. But after that, he didn't. Uh, these drugs especially affect memory as they activate two areas of the brain that help to control memories, the amygdala <clears throat> and the hippocampus. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you can't remember anything when you smoke pot. Uh, it uh, disrupts your short-term memory. If you don't have short-term memories, you can't possibly put it in long-term memory. So, and rave drugs are, are the same way. LSD uh, is the opposite. You remember everything from your trip, as exciting as that is. To the extent that if you start thinking about your trip, uh, and you think about this portion of your trip, sometimes you'll have a flashback and you'll start your trip right there, where, what, the, the part that you remembered, and you'll run it all the way through to the end. It's kind of like a movie. Turn on a movie and you know, you're, you're 30 minutes into the movie and then you just watch the rest of it. Well, LSD's kind of the same way. Sometimes you'll think about what happened during your trip and then it'll just play the rest of the way out. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't not trip, you're, you're, at that point you're having a flashback. I have a question. Yes. So how come, like, um, some people say they, they smoke pot and they do their homework and they, they think they have better outcomes at like, tests? Really? <laughs> That's probably, I wouldn't study and, uh, and do my, uh, and smoke pot at the same time. You won't remember anything. It, it disrupts your short-term memory. Yeah. So maybe they get stoned um, when they do They can concentrate. Maybe that's it. They can concentrate. Yeah, they can focus on something better. Okay, I'm sorry. Maybe they get stoned when they do their exam because um, one of the classes, I think it was you, you were saying, like, whatever you're doing when you're studying, right? Um, if you can, like, get that same kind right. of vibe <clears throat> or framework or whatever you were doing, then when you come to your exam and you're doing the same thing, then you remember everything. Yeah, I had a, a student that would play music while he was studying, and then all he needed to do was replay that music in his mind, and he remembered everything that he studied. So, yeah, you can do that. You know, connect the two pieces of information. I guess that works. I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd try it. I don't know if I'd try putting earbuds in my ears while you were taking a test because somebody will think you're listening to the answers. Or, I don't know. I don't know how they cheat anymore. I'm, I'm sure they do a, a very good job. <coughs> As people age from childhood to adolescence to adulthood, they learn to integrate the drives of the old brain with the reasoning and common sense of the new brain. If you're around a two-year-old or a three-year-old, they're not very logical. Uh, but as they get older, their, their new brain uh, overtakes their old brain. A lot of times they just want, want, want. They want this, they want that. Uh, and, they can't, and you can't convince them that, that uh, they can't have it. Uh, but as they get older, of course, they, they, their, their reasoning portion uh, becomes, more, becomes stronger. Developmental problems, uh, childhood traumas such as chaotic or abusive childhoods, uh, compulsive behavior, or psychoactive drug use can circumvent survival mechanisms and lead to irrational behavior or addiction. So people may become addicts because of some, some problem that they've had in the past. Remember, um, heroin works best for people that have, uh, have something to forget. So if you have childhood uh, traumas that you've been through, or if you were in an abusive home, maybe that's what you, you don't want to think about. So maybe that's why you use, uh, you use drugs, to, to not think about that stuff. But actually the best way to deal with that kind of a problem is to deal with that kind of a problem, is to talk about it, to get it out. That's what happens with military people. They talk about, the, they, if they need to find somebody that they can talk to about what they went through. And then uh, the more they talk about it, they more, the more their, their brain rationalizes what happened. Not rationalizes, that's not the right word. Um, deals with, uh, with what has happened to them. And then, of course, now they don't have a problem anymore. Now they can, they can think about it without, without it hurting them so much. 
The most important structure of the re reward reinforcement pathway is the nucleus accumbens septi. Uh, this bundle of nerves is the most powerful reinforcer in the pathway. It's right here, of course. It's a tiny little bundle of nerves. It is this area of the brain that drives people to action. Uh, research with rats stimulating this area of the brain led to death. Uh, they could not. Uh, they could do could do nothing else but stimulate this area. And of course, they they refer to it as the pleasure center. Uh, stimulating it makes you feel good. It makes you feel good. So you do it over and over and over again. Uh, of course, we haven't have actually killed any humans stimulating this area of the brain. But what we have found is that if you can stimulate that area of your brain, you won't stop until they force you to stop. We don't let people stimulate themselves to death. Uh, social factors tend to... I don't think so. <laughs> social factors tend to affect the obs obsession to use a psychoactive substance. The psychoactive substance alters the brain chemistry to make the individual want to use. This is one reason why only complete abstinence will stop the craving. You can never go back. And this is what happened to uh, the guy that just died, the funny guy, Robin Williams. Robin Williams. Robin Williams was a cocaine addict, and he got clean. And he, as long as he stayed away from cocaine, he was okay. But there are people out there that will tell you, yeah, you can use, just use a little bit. You know, now you know where to stop. Well, some people can't do that. For most people, you can't do that. You can't just have a beer. You've got to drink the whole damn case. Some people just can't do it. A lot of people just can't do it. Once you start that loop uh, again, it, it kicks in. And just before he died, uh, just before he committed suicide, he went back to rehab. Not because he was using, because he'd used one time. And he went back. And he, they call it a refresher. So he went back for a refresher. And when he came back, when he came out of rehab, that's when he committed suicide. Robin Williams. Robin Williams. Robin Williams hung himself. He strangled himself to death by putting, by looping a belt over a door and pressing until he went unconscious. Pressing down until he went unconscious. He consciously knocked himself out. And once he did, of course, the weight of his body strangled him, strangled him to death. But he was not in, he would, didn't hang himself. He, his feet were on the ground. He pressed until he, he, he uh, became unconscious. And then after that, of course, he's unconscious with the belt push, pushing against his neck. And he strangled himself to death. That's how he killed himself. It was a very conscious way to kill yourself. As interesting as that is, but at the same time, if you do that, then sometimes when you become unconscious, you roll away from your, your throat and you don't kill yourself. So he, he had, he had a 20-80 a chance to, to kill himself, 80-20 chance to kill himself, and he did, he killed himself. I know, this sounds really weird. <sighs> It's the stuff you get to deal with when you work in the emergency room. <sighs> Fun stuff. <clears throat> it's like shooting yourself in the chest. You're going to hit your heart or you're not going to hit your heart. Some people do it and they miss. <laughs> it's right here. I mean, it's only the size of your fist. Yeah. Just to, le to the left of your sternum, you know press the barrel of the gun against your, your chest and you pull the trigger, well, sometimes you miss. I mean, it's possible. Not every, you can't, you don't know where your heart is exactly. And some people's heart is closer to their sternum anyway. Maybe your heart is over here instead of over here. I know. It's weird, isn't it? Or they'll shoot themselves in the head. You know, if you shoot yourself through the mouth and you shoot straight up, then you'll probably kill yourself. But if you're off to the right a little bit, you know, you're not dead. Okay, that's the way it works. Sorry. We won't talk about this stuff anymore. Uh, the stop craving to begin.
Uh, and this is one of the reasons why you can't start again. I, I, that's, I, was start, I was talking about Robin Williams. Sorry to talk about suicide. That's something that you guys need to know about. Nobody likes to talk about it. Brain imaging has shown that brain cells uh, change as addiction develops. And this is something that we've seen with, uh, uh, with marijuana in, in, in the New Zealand study. Uh, while normal memory doesn't uh, take place until a, an action has been repeated three or more times, the intense stimulation can cause sensitization but with just one encounter. So the first time you eat that fruit and, you, and it tastes good and, and you're so hungry, it feeds you, uh, now you remember that that fruit is going to feed you, but it takes two more times to make sure that, that, that it wasn't a mistake. Now this is kind of a trick. Your brain works on a series of threes. If you're trying to learn, if you're uh, an athlete and you're trying to learn how to shoot a jump shot, if you can shoot a jump shot three good times, now you've got it down. It takes three times. This is one of the reasons why coaches, if, if they, they're trying to teach a, a team a play, uh, they, do it, they do it in six, uh, three times succession. One, two, and three. The third time you got it. The first time you weren't very good at it. The second time you were a little bit better at it. The third time you did it perfectly. So if you do anything in threes, and this is uh, uh, why they tell you to read your material. When I was in the mil military, they told us what they were going to tell us. They told us what they said they were going to tell us. And then they told us what they told us. And this is so that you would learn it. Now, I, I always learned it the first time they told me. I didn't need them to repeat it t two more times. But they always do anyway. They repeat everything two, two more times. Anyway, so if you do anything in threes, then probably you've got it. This is one of the reasons why they tell you to read your material, listen to the lecture, and then go over your material. You've, you've uh, consumed that material three times. And as long as you, you do anything three times, it's stuck in your long-term memory, and it won't go away. These neural pathways are highly sensitive and may cause relapse in just one uh, additional encounter. And of course, that's one of the reasons why you should never go back. You can never use it again. You can never take another drink. You can never shoot up with heroin <coughs> one time. I'm just going to do it once. That doesn't exist. You're, you will continue to do it. I'm, uh, I'm only going to smoke pot this one time. I'll never do it again. Yes, you will. You can never stop. Uh, why do psychoactive uh, drugs disrupt the uh, uh, on-off switches of the reward reinforcement pathway? We're not exactly sure. One theory is that since the, they don't uh, originate from an essential body need, the brain has no satiation point established for psychoactive substances. How much alcohol is the right amount of alcohol? Does anybody have a clue how much that is? Well, it has to do with your tolerance level, for one thing. Uh, I think I told you that uh, I had a drinking contest with my uh, first wife. Sec second wife, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't remember. Which wife I'm talking about. With my second wife. And I won. I know. I won. She was tanking on me. She, she was an alcoholic, and I didn't know that. And she was pretending that two beers was so much that she was drunk. She was, she was tanking. Her nickname, which I found out later, was the Jack Daniels Kid. She drank whiskey. So when she drank those two beers, she acted really goofy and started acting really strange. But uh, so I thought I won the contest. And, you know, we, we talked about that for, and then eventually we got married. But when she took off, she took off because she wanted to go, go out and drink again. She was using me not to drink because I didn't drink. I'm, I'm a really bad drinker and I don't believe in any of the psychoactive stuff. So she was using me as a, as a buffer between her, her and her addiction. And it, it finally, after about five months of marriage, that was as much as she could handle as far as her addiction was concerned. And she left. She loved my kids. She said she loved me. I don't know. She's crazy about my kids. <laughs> she, 
she and she never came back. She never came back. She left and she was gone. She just disappeared. And this is in the military. You can't disappear in the military. You have to go to work every day. That's not the way it works. You can't just wander off someplace. That's known as a wall. She was, and she left. She had she had uh, an assignment someplace else that I didn't know about. Nobody told me about it until she was gone. Was she a double agent? I think so. <laughs> she was a dental tech. I mean, what kind of information could she have? A second theory is that the on-off switch gets stuck on the on position. Uh, the person doesn't realize that the act has been completed. The person will use until they run out of the drug or they pass out. And of course, that happens a lot with alcohol. You see people pass out from drinking alcohol all the time. Well, you would think, I mean, geez, how often do you have to urinate? You should be able to know. Well, I've never, I've never passed out drunk. I'm not a very good drinker. Uh, the third theory is that the psychoactive drug creates such euphoria or pain relief that the on-off switch is ignored or overridden by the brain because it feels so damn good to, to be a, a rid of the pain or the euphoric feeling that it gives you. This reward reinforcement pathway, this dopamine surge that you get is so strong that you can't stop. Uh, fourth theory is that the psychoactive substance disrupts communication between the old and the new brain. Many psychoactive substances incapacitate the thinking and reasoning portion of the new brain, and the individual reverts to old brain instincts or automatic functioning. I have no idea how he got in there. And they close the door. They open the door, and this is what this is what the, he was had somehow gotten himself into the wheel well, <laughs> not the wheel well, but the whatever. Look how big his feet are, too. How in the world did they ever close that door? That's amazing. Anyway, I don't know if you've ever been around drunks. I I've had a, to pull people out of cars like this. I have a friend who um, picked his nose all the time when he got drunk, and, and it was really bad, you know. It was like this little, but he would just, like, pick his nose. So one time he passed out with his finger <laughs> in his nose. And we duct taped him to his seat. <laughs> <laughs> all the way from his shoulders, all the way down. It was so funny. Yeah. So it was a perpetual nose pick. <laughs> yeah. As funny as that is. I've had to pull people out of cars like this. And it wasn't from an automobile accident. It was because they, they leaked into that area. And now they couldn't get out because as uh, when they're sober, of course, their muscles t tense up. When you're drunk and you're passed out, you know, you, you have no control over anything and you just leak into whatever. I've had to pull people out of this thing. We, we had to take a, a seat out before. We had to get at it from the back. I, it was terrible. It was just terrible. And we couldn't move anything because if you moved anything, his bones might break. <clears throat> oh, it's terrible. Just get him drunk again. Yeah, just get him drunk again. <laughs> so, yeah, you have to ask yourself, what in the fireman pull him out? Well, they were afraid they'd hurt him, so we were the ones that got to do it. And that, that happened to me about three times when I was living in Omaha. A lot of drugs in Omaha. <clears throat> okay, uh, so why does all this happen? Uh, the main instrument for the nervous system, of course, is the neuron. Uh, the neuron is composed of the soma, the axon, and the dendrites. Information comes into the neuron through the dendrites and is distributed uh, to other entities through the terminals at the end of the axon. And it's these terminals that we're going to talk about. Each neuron can, can make uh, contact with one entity up to 150,000 entities. Uh, it is estimated that there are between 100 trillion to 500 trillion neuronal connections in the human body. Uh, our debt right now is $23 trillion. <laughs> so you've got lots more connections in your brain than $23 trillion. <coughs> Neurons are different uh, lengths from fractions of millimeters to the sciatic nerve that, run, that can be a meter long, depending on how long your leg is. It uh, runs from the top of your, your butt uh, to, the, your, to your heel. That's your sciatic nerve. Uh, and, of course, if the taller you are, the longer your sciatic nerve is. 
Neurons do not touch, but they do communicate with one another, of course. This communication takes place in the synaptic cleft, a gap between the two neurons. In order for the uh, two neurons to communicate, a chemical messenger called a neurotransmitter must pass between them. The neurotransmitter is housed in tiny sacs called vesicles. <clears throat> Why is all this important? Because as we talk about drugs, we talk about different neurotransmitters. If we're talking about LSD, LSD stimulates serotonin. Uh, ecstasy uh, stimulates uh, serotonin. Uh, marijuana stimulates the anandamide receptor sites. Uh, opiates work on the uh, endorphin receptor sites. So th that's one of the reasons why all of this is quite important. Uh, acetylcholine, uh, the neurotransmitter that activates your muscles, it also works as a vasodilator. Uh, it controls mental acuity, memory, and learning. Acetylcholine is extremely important. Uh, it decreases with age uh, and it causes rapid dementia referred to as Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they have done studies and they have determined that if you make it to 80 or uh, to 80 years old, that potentially you have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, why, so why in the world haven't we noticed this before? Because hardly anybody made it to, to 80 years old. And the ones that did, uh, that developed Alzheimer's disease, we, we assumed it was some form of dementia. We didn't even know what Alzheimer's disease was. But now, of course, uh, we are able to uh, look into the brain. Of course, this is after, after they die, post-mortem. Uh, we can look at the brain. We can determine how much damage they, they, they have. Uh, my mother lived to be 98 years old, fairly lucid. She was doing crossword puzzles uh, until about uh, two weeks before she died. Then she just, well, she always did the morning puzzle. She got to the point where she couldn't, you couldn't tell what letter she was making. Her A's, she didn't, didn't cross them anymore. Her F's were just a line like that. She didn't put that second line there. So it was really hard to, to tell what she was writing. But uh, she lost her ability to write, but not her ability to do crossword puzzles. Um, in, the, in the paper, she did the most complex crossword puzzles. She knew information, stupid information that nobody knows. The only thing that she didn't know was uh, uh, movies. She, she hated uh, Fellowship of the Ring, the, uh, that Tolkien trilogy. She hated that. So she didn't know who Bilbo was or Frodo. Uh, she hated Harry Potter. She, so she didn't know what Hogwarts was or anything. It was funny. She didn't know movies, okay? She didn't watch movies. Anyway, but she knew a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, acetylcholine was the first neurotransmitter that was discovered. And the reason it was discovered is because it has to do with muscle movement. And so we were trying to figure out uh, problems like multiple sclerosis, uh, atherolateral sclerosis. We are trying to figure those out, and we discovered acetylcholine. Uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, the second uh, two neurotransmitters that were discovered, they act as stimulants when the body demands energy. Uh, they control hunger, attention span, motivation, confidence, and alertness. Uh, epinephrine uh, leads to giving you more energy. Uh, so if you're ever in a fight or flight situation, uh, the substance that makes you feel like you need to fight or, fight or flee is epinephrine or adrenaline. Adrenaline is the other name for epinephrine. Uh, norepinephrine uh, gives you confidence and, and gives you a feeling of well-being. So one of the ways we can take your depression away is we can raise your norepinephrine level. And that usually works. Or we can stimulate you with epinephrine, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it makes you want to fight or flee. But if we can raise your norepinephrine level, we can make you feel good. It makes you feel confident. It makes you feel like everything's going to be okay. It doesn't make you happy, but it does make you confident. So if we, if we can raise your norepinephrine level, we can uh, uh, make you feel good. Uh, dopamine uh, regulates fine motor muscular activity, emotional stability, satiation. Uh, it's, of course, part of the reward reinforcement pathway. Uh, if you smoke cigarettes, uh, if you've ever smoked a cigarette, uh, you took that puff, it made you feel pretty good. Uh, the reason you felt good was because it was, in, it was increasing your dopamine level. You get a dopamine spike. Now, one of the interesting things about tobacco, of course, uh, pipes, uh, 
you get a, a pretty good surge of dopamine. Cigars, you get a pretty good surge of dopamine. Uh, but cigarettes, you get even more of a surge of dopamine. And the reason is because you can take uh, cigarette smoke is milder than, than other types of tobacco, and you pull it down into your lungs. And for that reason, people get a, a pretty good buzz off of cigarettes. Uh, the other thing that we need to talk, oh, chewing tobacco. Chewing tobacco and uh, snuff, uh, you have a constant level of dopamine. So instead of getting a, 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 a spike, a dopamine spike from puffing on your, on your cigarette, uh, it's, it's a constant, it's a constant high. And this is one of the reasons why so people chew tobacco. So if you take a chew, you have a constant... High, yeah, your dopamine level will, will, will slow, slowly rise and then it will level off. Yeah, that's why those guys don't... That's why they spit all the time. Oh God, it's nasty. Of course, eventually they're going to use up most of the nicotine and spit it all out. Hopefully they do. But uh, the other thing that you need to know about uh, snuff is that uh, there's fiberglass in there and it cuts your gums. I know, it opens up wounds in your, in your mouth so that the nicotine gets into your system faster. How stupid is that? Pretty, pretty stupid. What time is it? Fitbit, it's just done. Okay, it's almost time. Let me do one more. Uh, histamine. Histamine controls the inflammation of tissue and allergic reactions. It regulates emotional behavior and it regulates sleep. Uh, this is one of the reasons if you have a cold or you have a runny nose, you can take an antihistamine. See, it, has to, it controls inflammation and allergic reactions. And uh, it'll go away. Your, your uh, runny nose will go away with an antihistamine. If you have, if you've injured yourself, you've damaged something on your hand and it's, and it's swollen. You've got a wound on your hand. If you take an antihistamine, that swelling will go down. <clears throat> this is one of the things that you can do if you have a uh, sprained ankle. You take an antihistamine, the swelling will go down. I don't know, it's kind of exciting, isn't it? Okay, well, we'll, we'll pick this up next time right here, maybe, if I remember. <laughs> So I'll see you guys on Thursday. It's much fun.